Welcome to this week's lesson. This week's lesson, we are in Unit 12, uh, new, new Unit, uh, Session 1, at Solomon the Wise King. Uh, this week, we're kind of going back into the Old Testament uh, as we study 1 Kings here. Uh, in this book, we've, we will find the story of King Solomon. Uh, what was King Solomon recognized for or remembered for? Uh, two things, pretty much. One was his wisdom, and the second was the building of the temple. Uh, Solomon is not the only king in the book, though. Uh, First King has an account of other kings from that period of time and, and the past uh, who ruled during the first uh, 75 years of the divided kingdom. So it was David, uh, and then it was, uh, I mean, Saul, David, and then Solomon, and then the uh, kingdom was split into two different kingdoms, okay? And so we're just going to study Solomon, and so we're still one united kingdom at this point. Uh, there were good kings, and when after it split, though, there were some good kings and there were bad kings, uh, and you could see uh, as it divided there that the northern kingdom uh, was known as Israel, the southern kingdom was known as uh, Judah, and uh, some of them had good kings, some of them had bad kings. Our study picks up in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, uh, where David was about to make Solomon the king over the united Israel. Uh, let's think about it for Solomon's situation for just a minute here. Uh, you're, you know, you're Solomon, you're about to become king, uh, you're about to be leader of this, this huge nation, this great nation uh, that has finally found peace and, and prosperity and uh, uh, you know, you kind of I thought about that, and I thought about kind of like our nation before we had the president we have now. Uh, but they were they were doing well as a country. As Solomon, your father is one of the greatest leaders uh, of all time. Uh, you're young, you're inexperienced, you're naive. Uh, your brothers want to be king. Uh, they want the position that your father's given you. Uh, your father's generals have. Uh, very little confidence in you, uh, your leadership skills. Uh, so there are great expectations for your ability uh, to carry on this great legacy of your fathers. And so Solomon, uh, Solomon has a tough job here. So how will you ever meet, much less exceed these expectations you're thinking to yourself if you're Solomon? Uh, it all sounds very intimidating, doesn't it? Uh, and this was Solomon's first day on the job. That's what it would have been like. Uh, I want you to imagine for a moment if you uh, were starting a college and uh, you were training new kings, uh, what kind of courses would you offer? What would be the names of them or what, what would they be about? Well, I'd sit there and thought about a few. Uh, war 101, you know, because as a king, there's, you often deal with war, uh, how to make just laws, uh, maybe a class called "Living with Integrity," uh, how to deal with how to deal with conflict, how to deal with uh, unruly employees. These would all be very useful courses uh, if you were a king. Uh, we can often find ourselves in circumstances that are over our head. I remember when I worked for Bell South, uh, I was told by my boss one time to hire somebody, a specific person. Uh, the manager who this person would have reported to was uh, the one that was getting this new person. Uh, that, this manager told me that they needed somebody with some programming skills. That's what they wanted because uh, they were doing some things that really need somebody with those kind of skills. Uh, this person I was supposed to hire had no programming skills. And so uh, one day my boss came by and uh, my desk and he asked me, he said, uh, had I hired this person yet? And I said, no, uh, he's not really qualified for this open position that we have. And at which point this boss of mine, he strongly reminded me uh, of how many positions he had put me in that I was not qualified for. And so he was quick to remind me of that. Uh, and long story short, uh, this guy was not hired uh, because he did not pass the entrance level test for managers. And so uh, the good Lord took care of that for me uh, and helped me out through that non-hire. So I was appreciative of that. But not only that, my boss uh, 
uh, never told me to hire a specific person again. He would often say, if you hire them, you've got to fire them. So, uh, uh, and I, I like that a lot better. So uh, we can find ourselves in over our heads at times. Uh, uh, we don't know what to do, what we need, or how to solve a specific problem. Uh, our insufficiencies are exposed at times. Uh, we even feel like, feel like failures at times. We're ashamed or, or embarrassed. Uh, we can't measure up to expectations. We, uh, we, we think to ourselves at times. Uh, we, we face the same feelings when it comes to spiritual situations. You know, we don't measure up. But we're not there spiritually. Uh, when Solomon becomes king here, he felt completely overwhelmed. Um, so where does he go for help? Where do we see him going for help? Well, right off the bat, we see he goes to his Lord for help. He goes to his Lord. So what should we do? What should we do when we feel overwhelmed? Well, we should do the same thing he did. We should go to the Lord. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we have uh, a Bible that we can go to. We can read our Bible. Uh, we can pray. We can ask for help or guidance from some other godly person, uh, consult a godly friend for advice, talk to a pastor. So we have a lot of avenues that we can do there. So that's what we we need to do when we f feel overwhelmed and uh, spiritually especially. But before we jump into the lesson, I do want to say a prayer for us before we get started. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, as always, to study your word, Lord. And Lord, we, we thank you for your grace. Uh, we pray for uh, open hearts and open, open minds today, Lord, as, as you bring this word to us. Help us to apply it in our lives. Help us to grow from it spiritually. And Lord, help us to share it with others as you'd want us to share it. Lord, we thank you for your son and everything he's done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so the first verse, first set of verses we're going to go to is in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 2, 1 through 4. So let's go there. As time approached for David to die, he instructed his son Solomon, As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong and be courageous like a man. And keep your obligations to the Lord, you, your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses so that you will have a success in everything you do and wherever you turn and so that the Lord will carry out his promise that he made to me. If your sons are careful to walk faithfully before me with their whole mind and heart, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. So our lesson picks up in the uh, beginning of chapter two here as David's pretty much on his deathbed. And uh, the previous chapter we saw where one of David's sons, Adonai, uh, had pretty much tried to set himself up to be king. Uh, he had support uh, for that from the high priest. He had support from David's military commander. Uh, but later in chapter 1, we saw where David has Solomon uh, anointed as the king by the prophet Nathan. So uh, Solomon was going to be king, no one else. Uh, David was keeping that promise uh, by making Solomon uh, king to his mother, uh, Bathsheba. So that was a promise that he had made her. Uh, this lesson picks up where David has called for his son Solomon and uh, to give him some final words, if you will. Uh, David knows his days are numbered, and he says, As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. Uh, so uh, statistics show that one out of one people die. And so that's pretty much what David's saying. I'm going just like the rest of them. And so his days were numbered, and he knew it. Uh, and David also knew that things were not going to be easy for Solomon. He knew that. So David gives him, Solomon, three commands here. And the first command he gives him, he says, be strong. And if you remember our study of Joshua, uh, God and the people told Joshua to be strong and courageous. I've actually got a Bible uh, cover that I use, that said, and it has that scripture on there about being strong and courageous. All good leaders, all good leaders are strong and courageous. You have to be to be a good leader. Uh, 
we can see what happens when you have a weak leader. Uh, uh, we've seen it in with Saul. We've seen it. Uh, what's going on in our own country here? No one respects you, and uh, when that when you don't have that respect, uh, then things can go bad. Uh, good leaders lead by conviction. Uh, David knew this was a this. He knew this. He was directing Solomon to do the same. Make sure you have conviction when you lead. Uh, God chose Solomon over his brothers. And the fact that God did that, the fact that God chose him should enable him to have a you know confidence and be uh, convicted in his uh, leadership. He should be uh, have faith in that leadership because God has chosen him. All right? So God was a blessing to him. He was blessing him. Uh, that brings us to David's second command. Uh, second command was be a man. Be a man. And in other words, it was time for him to grow up. Time for him to grow up. Time to mature. Uh, God chose you to rule the people is what David's saying here. God chose you. And so the third uh, command that David gives here is keep your obligation to the Lord. Okay, keep your obligation to the Lord. So what was Sol Solomon's obligation to the Lord? Well, to obey God's law first and foremost. That was, that was his obligation. Uh, when we thought, think about our own obligation as believers, what's our obligation? Well, our obligation is the same, to keep God's law, to keep God's commands, his decrees, those things. So how was Solomon supposed to do this? Uh, David explains to him, he says, to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. In other words, he's saying just walk the walk, walk the walk. Uh these, these decrees and these uh, commands uh, could all be found in their Bible of the time, okay? In their Bible of the time, in the law of Moses, it says. So that's where they would find those. And so they had a guide, just like we have a guide today. Uh, our guide is even more complete. So David, through his own life experiences, was trying to uh, give Solomon the best advice he could give him uh, on his deathbed there, and uh, pretty much. And David knew how important it was to follow God's commands uh, and God's guidance. He's, he's, he's lived through some times when he didn't, and so he understood how important that was. Uh, David knew the suffering that would, could occur if you did not follow God's commands and his ways. And so he's been through that. Uh, we do the same thing with our kids, if you think about it. Hopefully we do. Uh, learn from my mistakes, we'll tell them, and... Uh, Avoid life's lessons that I had to learn. Of course, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. Uh, follow God. Don't follow me. Follow God. Be obedient to God. No one else. And so <clears throat> we can give good advice to our children as well. Very interesting here. Part of God's law can be found in Deuteronomy uh, 17, 18 through 20. Uh, let me go ahead and read that for us. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. He is seated on the throne. He is to write a copy of this instruction for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. It is to remain with him. He is to read from it all the days of his life so that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, to observe all the words of his instructions and to do these statutes. Then his heart will not be exalted above the, his countrymen. He will not turn from his, this command to the right or the left. And he and his sons will continue ruling for many years over Israel. And so what that was talking about is uh, the king was supposed to make a copy of their law, of, of the book of Moses, more or less, and keep that copy and read it every day. And so it was to keep them in check. And that's what, uh, that's what it was telling them to do there. God knows how important it is uh, for us to stay plugged into his word there. And so that's what we should do as believers as well. We don't necessarily have to go make a copy of the Bible ourselves and write it down by hand. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is a good thing to be plugged into his word. It's the, uh, the light that lights our path. Uh, and uh, let's, let's read some scripture from uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. 
2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. And so there's, there's a whole lot we can get out of God's word, and God wants us to study his word and be plugged into that. Why does David want Solomon to study and know the fo- know and follow God's words and commands? Why does he want him to do that? And well, it tells us that in verse 3 there, it says, so that you will have success. And so studying God's word will bring success in life. Doesn't mean you're going to have not have valleys and things like that, but you can have success in life. It will it will help you. Uh, here, and it's, he says success, success in what? And in verse 3, it tells Solomon the answer to that. It says, in everything you do, in everything you do, wherever you turn, you know, you're going to have success if you stay plugged into God's Word. And so uh, that, was a, that was something he needed to do. So if you study all the kings of uh, Israel, you'll see uh, where the good kings uh, follow God's directions. We refer to those as the good kings. In the northern kingdom, uh, it did not last as long as the southern kingdom. Why was that? Well, it was because of the poor leadership. The kings of the northern kingdom uh, didn't last as long because they didn't study God's word. They weren't plugged into God's word. They didn't follow God's commands. Uh, David understood this. He already understood this. As the king goes, so goes the people. And so David understood that. Uh, verse 4, uh, one more reason Solomon needed, Solomon needed to obey God's law was so the Lord will fulfill his promise that he had made to David. And so that's why David wanted him to, to uh, follow him, obey God's law, to, so he could fulfill the promise he had made to David. Well, the promise to David was a son would always sit on the throne of Israel. And so uh, we could read that in 2 Samuel, uh, two, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. Let's go there. Samuel 7, 12 through 16 says, When your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendants who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with a human rod and with blows from others. But my faithful love will never leave him as I removed it from Saul. I removed him from your way. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. So the question is, was that promise fulfilled? Was that promise fulfilled But to, to David? We know that promise was fulfilled in, in Jesus, the Messiah. And uh, we also know that uh, all kings, there were 20 of them who ruled after David. Uh, all of them were his descendants. Okay, uh, There was no coup or anything like that that ever interrupted the line of David. And so Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that promise to David there. Let's read some scripture from the New Testament. Let's read from Luke 1, 31 through 33. Let's go there. Luke 1, 31 through 33. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. God keeps all of his promises, and God kept that promise to David, as we see through Jesus Christ there. All right, so uh, let's go on to our next question. Don't forget to put comments in the comment section if you have any comments. But let's go on and read uh, 1 Kings 3, uh, 4 through 9. 1 Kings 3, 4 through 9. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there because it was the most famous high place. 
he offered 1,000 burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, Ask, what should I give you? And Solomon replied, You have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. You have continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. Lord my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people. You have chosen a people too numerous to be counted. So give your servant an obedient heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? So Solomon is established as king at this time. Uh, he goes to one of the most famous high places that there was at the time to offer a sacrifice. And uh, these high places uh, normally were located on hills and mountaintops, things like that. And the high places had once been pagan Canaanite shrines, so uh, places that the pagans would worship. Uh, they were supposed to be destroyed. Uh, most of those temples were supposed to be destroyed. Some still existed. Uh, so why did God want all them destroyed? Why did he want these shrines destroyed? Well, uh, God was afraid his people uh, would blend their worship with these false gods, with, with their one true God. And so that's what he was afraid of. Of course, that did happen. Uh, if you recall from our study of 1 Samuel, uh, Saul had built an altar here in Gibeon. It was actually the first altar built by a, an Israel king. Uh, another reason this place was so popular it was where the tabernacle was at. The tabernacle was here. The bronze altar was here. Uh, remember, though, that the Ark of the Covenant had been brought to Jerusalem by David, and so the Ark of the Covenant was now in Jerusalem. Uh, Solomon goes uh, here, and he gives this huge offering of a thousand burnt offerings. Uh, let me read something from 1 Kings 3.3 3 and 3.1 for us. Hang on just a minute. In 3.3 3 here, it says, Solomon loved the Lord by walking in his statutes of his father, David, but he also sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Yeah, but if you read it, uh, if you read up here at Solomon at three one, it says Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, by marrying Pharaoh's daughter. Solomon brought her to live in the city of David until he was finished building his palace, the Lord's temple, and the wall surrounding Jerusalem. So what we see here is Solomon has the same problem many of us have today. It's uh, many of us have a bad case of dueling desires, dueling desires. And uh, on one hand, you know, we want to please God. On the other hand, we want to please ourselves. Uh, our own desires get in the way of pleasing God. Now look at Solomon here. He loves the Lord, it says. He offers sacrifices and he offers his worship to God. We see that. But he's doing it from a uh, pagan high place. He's doing it at the wrong place. So he has taken this foreign wife too, we see here, this, this wife from Egypt. Uh, not even supposed to do that, not supposed to marry a foreign woman. And uh, he wasn't even supposed to go to Egypt anymore once they came out of Egypt. So Solomon's doing things that he shouldn't do. So Solomon, like us, you know, he, at times he has the divided heart. Yet God is still there. We still see God says the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. So even though he's not always doing what he needs to do, God does appear to him. Uh, God often does this through, throughout the uh, scriptures we see here with the, where he appears in these dreams. We saw it with Jacob, we saw it with Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David. They all had the, these dreams. Uh, but this dream's different. This dream's different. Uh, God's really not giving any kind of instructions here. Instead, God asked a simple question. He asked a simple question. 
what should I give you? What should I give you? And once again, we see a picture of God's grace here and his love to David's son. And uh, Solomon does nothing to earn this grace that we see here. Uh, as a matter of fact, Solomon's done things that he shouldn't, that we just talked about. Uh, yet God is faithful. God is faithful in his love for Solomon uh, and, and also for his lo love for Solomon's father, David. And we know David had his faults too. Um, but David walked in faithfulness and righteous, righteousness and integrity, it tells us here in, in verse 6. So David did get his life straightened out. Uh, and also he's, he did that before you know, he became king, so that's why God made him king. Now, Solomon recognizes it's because of God's promise to David uh, that he has become king. Again, nothing he's done, nothing he's done, but it's because of a promise he made to David. God promised David his son would become king, so here's Solomon becoming king. Solomon refers to himself here as a, as a youth. Uh, some translations have a child in verse 7. Uh, at this time, Solomon is probably about 20 years old. Uh, he had little to no uh, administration-type skills. Uh, just think about when you were 20, what kind of skills you might have had. Uh, could you run a country at the age of 20? Uh, so I know I couldn't have. I couldn't run my own life, much less a country. So uh, uh, I'd be going to God too. That's what he's doing here. He's going to God, and Solomon was admitting to God that he needed help. He needs help. And he's putting away all his pride, and he's putting away everything, and he's asking God for help. God help me. Uh, does this sound familiar? That's what I wrote here. Does this sound familiar? Kind of sounds like the same place that I got to uh, at the age of 15 years old. At the age of 15, I, was, I, was, I wasn't about to come, become a king. I was about to become a child of the king. So, uh, But I had to put away something. I had to put away my pride, and I had to humble myself, uh, just like what Solomon's doing here. Uh, Solomon knew there was, this was a huge job that he had in front of him, uh, he, he he would be king over all of Israel. It says here, too many to be numbered. Too many to be numbered. Probably seven, several million by now. So a lot of people. So Solomon knew he needed help. And that's why he's going to the Lord. So what does Solomon say he needs? Well, the first thing he says he needs, he needs some discernment. He needs the ability to discern between good and evil. So he wants to be able to know the difference and be able to see the difference. And, uh, what would make that possible? What what would make that thing that kind of thing possible? Well, he mentions there a receptive heart. He needs a receptive heart, or a listening heart, uh, obedient heart. That's what he's looking for. And how does one discern what is right or wrong, good versus evil? Uh, first, you have to listen, and you have to get to the heart of the matter. And uh, when I read that, I thought about Jesus and how he did that with the Ten Commandments. We saw him in the New Testament do that. Uh, Jesus got down to the heart of the matter when it came to like the Ten Commandments. If you hate your brother, Jesus said, you've committed murder in your own heart. So he's getting down to the heart of the matter there. He said, if you lust after a, another man's wife or woman, uh, you've committed adultery in your heart. All right, so uh, getting to the heart of the matter again. Um, Solomon knew this was a very important skill to have in order to rule over so many people. So that's what he's asking for. And who's the best one to ask for such a skill? Uh, none, none better to ask than the God, the all-knowing God. And so that's what he's doing. He's asking for this, this particular skill. you have any? Uh, let's go on and read uh, 1 Kings 3, 10 through 15. 1 Kings 3, 10 through 15. 1 Kings 3, 10 through 15. Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this. So God said to him, Because you have requested this and did not ask for long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, but you ask discernment for yourself to understand justice, I will therefore do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and understanding heart. 
so that there has never been anyone like you before or never will be again. In addition, I will give you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that no man in any kingdom will be your equal during your entire life. If you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands, just as your father David did, I will give you long life. Then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. He went to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant, and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he held a feast for all his servants. So God was pleased with Solomon here. We see that. Uh, he was pleased with that request. The thing that he was asking for was a receptive heart. And this shows us right there that, that Solomon understood uh, who God was. He understood that. Uh, God is the great I am. He understood that. He's the sovereign God and the true king of Israel. So Solomon understood every bit of that. And you can see it in what he's asking for here. Solomon understood himself to be the, the vessel that God was going to use to, to reign uh, over his people. Uh, Solomon did not treat God like some kind of genie in the bottle, you know, asking for three wishes to be granted. He asked for something he needed in order to carry out God's work. He didn't ask for things like long life, wealth, uh, the destruction of his enemies. He didn't ask for stuff like that. He asked for things like discernment and how to administer justice. Those were the things he was looking for, to lead the people fairly. He wanted to lead them, not only lead them, but leading them fairly. Uh, he wanted to be one of those good kings. Uh, he wanted to be a blessing to the people of Israel. Uh, Solomon wanted to be a wise king. And, uh, God, in verse 12 here, gave Solomon a wise and understanding heart. So he, he, he does give Solomon what he's looking for, uh, a wisdom and understanding like None before him and none after. So above and beyond is what God gives here. And God always outgives us. Uh, my book says this. He says, this is not simply knowing things, but it's acting with wise justice. And I think uh, in some previous studies about wisdom, uh, one of the definitions I read was uh, uh, is, wisdom is defined as the proper application of knowledge. The proper application of knowledge is wisdom. Acting with wise justice, in other words. Uh, and boy, is, is there a lack of that going on in today's world. Uh, there doesn't seem like anybody's acting with wise justice at all, or fair. Uh, once again, we see God's grace uh, in action by b blessing Solomon in this way. Uh, God gave Solomon more ability uh, to per perceive what was right and wrong than anybody that was ever given that. Uh, gave Sol Solomon the, every bit of knowledge and wisdom that he needed there to act in a way for the good of others. And so Solomon was uh, given that by the Lord. Look at the abundance of God's grace here. Uh, Solomon was given wisdom that he asked for that would be unparalleled to anybody in history. Uh, God gave Solomon these riches and this honor. Uh, so above and beyond in verse 13 there, uh, Solomon would be the greatest king that ever lived during his lifetime. Okay, so God goes above and beyond here. And it's gonna be the, he's going to be the greatest at what he does here, kind of like uh, Nick Saban, <laughs> the GOAT. Greatest of all time. Uh, verse 14, uh, we see a very large word here that only has two characters. Uh, the word is if, if, okay? So God makes the last part of Solomon's blessing here conditional. And I come from a computer background and all programmers know, uh, know this as an if then else statement. Uh, if this, if this, then this, else this, okay? Uh, if this, then this, else this. So if you walk in my ways, God says, and you keep my statutes and commands as your father David did, then I will give you long life, okay? Else, 
Uh, I don't think it's too hard to figure out what the else is. It's not long life, right? So this woke Solomon up, uh, literally woke him up. Uh, he realized it was a dream at this point, right? And notice what he does here when he wakes up. He, he uh, leaves the high place. He leaves his high place and he goes back to Jerusalem. Uh, so why does he go there? Why does he go there? Well, to worship God in a proper way, uh, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Uh, he does that. He does that standing before the Ark of the Covenant in front of that mercy seat that's on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which uh, represented the throne of God. Uh, he's already showing wisdom here. He's already showing wisdom because this is probably where he should have been in the first place, not at some high place. Uh, it used to be a pagan worship place. Uh, look what else he does here. Uh, he, he held a feast. He held a feast for all his servants, it says here. Uh, we used to call that um, a, team, a team building exercise at Bell South and AT&T. And so he's team building here, which is, you know, that's uh, showing that he's already showing some good leadership skills here. So I want to read 2 Samuel 6, 17 through 19. So let's go there real quick. 2 Samuel 6, 17 through 19 says, They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent David had set up for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings in the Lord's presence. When David had finished the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of hosts. Then he distributed a loaf of bread, a date cake, and raisin cakes to each one in the entire Israelite community, both men and women. Then all the people left, each to his own home. So what we're seeing here is David, uh, Solomon, I mean, Solomon is already following in his father's footsteps here. Uh, Solomon's actions show us he's not only understood that the love and grace of God had shown on him, so he appreciated it as well. He appreciated it. He's, he's sharing it with other people. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this, uh, as we go through the next week, uh, do you appreciate God's love and grace? Do you appreciate God's grace and love. In the coming days, in the coming weeks, months, it would be wise for us to show him, to show him how thankful we are uh, for all the blessing that he gives us, that he's given us and our families. Amen. So I hope you do that in the next coming week and every, every day of your life you should do that. And I hope you do. Uh, he has given us all so much and he's blessed us uh, more than we know. And so I hope you enjoyed this lesson. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as always, feel free to contact me. and I'd love to discuss it with you. Uh, and in the meantime, I hope you have a great week and hope you come back here next week. Thanks. Have a great week.